turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 as we continue our journey through the Bible. Paul had established the church in Corinth, but after Paul left, a lot of problems arose. There developed divisions within the body of Christ. And it is always a sad thing when the body of Christ becomes divided. Paul, speaking about the things of the ministry, the pressures that he had, the various experiences and difficulties, he said, and beside all these, the care of all of the churches that I have daily. And so when he heard of the divisions and all in the church in Corinth, that it, it was just a burden on Paul's heart. There were several issues. There were the issues of the abuse of the gifts of the Spirit, which we will be getting to in chapters 12 and 14. There was the mixed-up teaching concerning the resurrection and the division over the belief in the resurrection. He deals with that in, chapters, in chapter 15. There were marks of carnality and these divisions were a part of the marks of carnality. There was an abuse of the Lord's Supper and he deals with that. Now there were divisions as far as Christian liberty is concerned and this is one of the things that he deals with in chapter 8. The divisions that had come because some people felt a liberty to do anything, where others felt that certain things were wrong to do. Now, the Lord hasn't in the Bible spelled out every activity. In other words, you don't find anything in the Bible that says you shouldn't go to movies. Why? Because they didn't have movies in those days. <laughs> and, and there are a lot of things that Christians are wondering, you know, well, is it all right for me as a Christian? And there are some Christians that believe it's all right to go to movies. There are others who are strongly opposed. There are those who believe it's all right to smoke, and there are others who believe that it's a sin. Others believe that it's all right to have a little wine with your meal, beer with your pizza. There are others who feel that that is wrong. And, and a lot of times, what we accept and what we don't accept has a lot to do with our culture, where we live. For instance, in Europe, in Germany and all, um, it would really not be a shock for a church to have a beer party. Uh, it's just a part of their culture. They don't look upon it as, as something that is wrong. So uh, there are those who have the feeling that they have a liberty to do certain things where others feel convictions against it. And, and that is always the case. And thus it creates sort of a division. I feel that I have liberty to do something. Someone else uh, feels a, a conviction against that. And so how are we to react to each other? There are some people who feel very convicted about going to a public beach. And uh, there are others who have no convictions about that at all. How are we to react 
towards each other when we have these strong differences of opinions on what I as a Christian can do and what I as a Christian should not do. So someone had written to Paul, told him of the problems, and so Paul is seeking to bring a balance uh, to the church in Corinth. So referring to the letter, he said, now as touching the things that have been offered unto idols, we know that we have all knowledge, but knowledge puffs up. Charity builds up. Paul, in writing to the Romans, said that those who are strong in the faith eat meat. Those who are weak in the faith are vegetarians. And so the person who eats meat should not look down upon the vegetarian, nor should the vegetarian judge the person who eats meat. God accepts all of us. Now we have the issue of if meat has been offered in a sacrifice in a pagan temple to one of the pagan deities, can I as a Christian, eat that meat. This subject Paul will come back to in the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians because when you took a sacrifice to the priest in the pagan temple to offer it to one of the pagan gods, part of the lamb would be sacrificed on the altar. Part of it would be given to the priest as sort of his gratuity for offering it for you. And then part of it you were able to keep and use for your own personal family needs. Now, with the priest offering many sacrifices during the day and getting a portion of each of the sacrifices. He would have more meat than he could possibly eat and so he would sell the extra meat to the butcher shop. And the butcher shops would have this meat along with the other meat in their cases for sale usually just strung up, not in a case, but strung up and carved off as it's hanging there. Now, in the 10th chapter, Paul said, when you go into the butcher shop to buy meat, you see a good cut that you want, don't ask the butcher, was this sacrifice to an idol? He said, just buy it and go home and enjoy it. Don't ask questions about it for your conscience sake. Because he said, yeah, I came from the temple this morning. And all. Then if you ate it, you might have pangs of conscience. It might trouble you. You might say, oh, at night, you know, we've got a stomach cake. I'll bet it's because I ate that meat, you know, that was sacrificed. And, you know, and you, you get those guilty feelings. He said, if someone invites you to dinner and the meat is there on the table. Don't ask them. Just eat what is set before you, asking no questions for your conscience sake. So he'll deal with that aspect of it in chapter 10. But in this chapter, he's dealing with the divisions that had developed because of those that felt the liberty to eat that meat they said, well, we have knowledge, we, we understand, we know that these idols are nothing but marble or stone, or perhaps wood. They're nothing. They are representing deities that don't exist. 
These gods that they are worshiping aren't real gods at all. They're the figments of their imaginations. And so because these idols are only representing the figment of people's imaginations, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to eat this meat that's been sacrificed to idols. We have the knowledge. But Paul said knowledge puffs up, and this is so often the case. One of the tragic things about uh, universities and all is the intellectual snobbery that is often developed around these institutions. Uh, all you have to do is to go to these institutions and, and you will see uh, what Paul is declaring. Knowledge puffs up. People become very puffed up over their knowledge. But Paul said, if any man thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. You think you're smart? <laughs> you really know nothing. So little, man, poor man, so ignorant in that which he knows best. The person who thinks he knows the most usually knows the least. Because the more you know, the more you know you don't know. And the vast amount of knowledge is multiplying by computer and all of the communicative sciences that we have today. Our total accumulation of knowledge is just growing so rapidly. All of the accumulated knowledge of man from the time of Adam until the year 1965, all of the th knowledge of the sciences and all that men had accumulated in that time doubled in that next decade between 1965 and 1975. The accumulated knowledge of man doubled in just 10 years. Now knowledge is doubling in less than five years. So that they say that 10 years from now, we presently only know 5% of what man will know in 10 years. It sort of reminds us of the Tower of Babel where God spoke about their increased knowledge at that time as they were endeavoring to build this skyscraper. And, and he said that because of their knowledge, nothing will be held back, and that's when God intervened. They were not using their knowledge for the right purposes. You know, it's amazing what we can do now with email, communicate with people around the world. We can, uh, we can bring into our computers just so much knowledge. But with this comes the opportunity to know so much evil. What can serve a good and wonderful purpose can be used to destroy a man's mind, fill it with pollution. Now, I'm excited about the potential of the Internet. We have our Calvary Chapel web page, and people can dial in, and they can pull down the whole 5,000 series of our commentaries through the Bible. They can listen in Japan live the sermon that you're hearing here. We get letters from people in Japan and Europe 
and around the world who are tuning in to our Calvary Pap Chapel web and are listening to the services and they're hearing them as you are hearing them. That's amazing. It's marvelous technology and it has great potential for getting the Word of God out. With the new CD-ROMs, we will be able to put on three CD-ROMs the entire 5,000 series, the commentaries through the whole Bible. In fact, we're in the process of doing that right now. Imagine what that is going to mean as far as getting the Word of God out. Rather than smuggling Bibles into China, all we'll have to do is take a bunch of CD-ROMs in the suitcase. <laughs> and, and they'll not only have through the Bible, they'll have the teaching and the commentary, which the Chinese are sending out and saying, oh, we need the teaching of the Word. We need, you know, we need the teaching desperately. Well, well, we'll soon be able to get it into them on the cd ROMs. Glorious, marvelous, the technology. What knowledge is, is affording us to do today in spreading the gospel. As we are speaking here tonight, it's being carried on a line to uh, Twin Falls, Idaho, where it is being beamed up to a satellite some 53,000 miles out there in space. From the satellite, it's being directed back down to little transmitters across the United States. We have some 54 stations now that are picking up the uh, broadcast from the satellite so that while we are sitting here tonight studying the Word, people all over the United States can be tuned in and listening to the Bible study that we have here and are listening. That's marvelous that God has afforded us this technology. But the problem is what can be used for good is also being used for evil. And so the availability of evil is so prevalent through the Internet. The horrible, horrible, mind-polluting junk that's available. Knowledge, it puffs up. And if you think you know anything, <laughs> ten years from now you'll know nothing <laughs> compared with what is able to be known or what has been discovered the vast accumulation of knowledge. But if any man loves God, and, and that it's not what you know that really counts, it's your love for God. That's where it's really at. The same is known of God. God knows you. His child. He's concerned for you. He watches over you. Now, the fascinating thing to me is that with all of the knowledge that we are attaining and achieving, it's not a drop in the bucket to all that God knows. We're only discovering what God already knew. One of the characteristics or, or one of the attributes of God is his all knowledge, omniscience. He knows all science. It's interesting that a lot of the things that we are discovering are things that have existed. We're just now discovering them. But God knew them all the time. And we haven't yet caught up with him. 
And if we continued to expand our knowledge at the exponential rate, doubling every five years, throughout eternity, you'd still not catch up to God. But the beautiful thing is that God knows me. And God loves me. Now, he brings up the issue concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that have been offered in sacrifice to idols. We know that an idol is nothing. We have knowledge. We realize an idol is nothing. And that there is none other God but one. We know this. We know that these various pagan deities that men are worshiping, these great temples that have been built to the various gods, we know that they are nothing. Now, Paul's going around and preaching the one God created problems in this Western society of those days, which was very polytheistic. You remember when Paul was in Ephesus, the silversmith, Diotrephes, got stirred up and stirred up the other fellows in his trade because business was down. And they recognized that it was Paul's fault. He's saying that these little idols that we're making of Diana aren't real gods. People aren't buying the little idols anymore. Fellas, we're going to be out of business if we don't do something about this guy, Paul. And, and they were concerned because Paul was teaching there was only one true God. And these images and these idols were really nothing. They were representing deities that did not exist. And so Paul said, we know this. We know that idols are nothing and that there is only one God. For though there be those that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him. And there's only one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. We know this. We have this knowledge. There are many that are called gods. They're not gods. There's only one true God, the Father. And we exist by him or for him. And we know there's only one Lord Jesus Christ. And by whom are all things. And Paul asserts that in Colossians, that he is the creator of all things. And so by him all things exist and are held together. And we are by him. How be it? There is not in every man this knowledge. Not everyone understands this. Many who were converted to Jesus Christ still believed that there were some mystic powers in these idols that uh, these gods somehow existed as sub-gods. And, and they really felt that there was something sinister behind. And Paul does affirm that later on. He said, they that worship idols are worshiping demons. And so much of the worship was the worship of demons, there was uh, demonology and 
uh, the worship of demons. And Paul recognized that. But they're not gods. They're only evil spirits. But everybody doesn't have this knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol, unto this hour, eat it as a thing that's been offered to an idol. And their conscience, because it is weak, is defiled. If they eat meat that's been offered to an idol, they, they feel guilty. They, they feel that, wow, you know, I'm, I'm sinning. And their conscience is defiled because they really do believe that there is something to the idol that is being worshipped. But Paul said, Meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. In other words, it has nothing to do in reality with my actual relationship with God, whether I eat or I don't eat. If I don't eat that meat, I'm not any better off. I'm not any more spiritual. Spirituality is not a matter of what I'm eating. Eating almonds is not more spiritual than eating peanuts. <laughs> and, and thus, he recognized that I'm, I'm not spiritual or made spiritual. It doesn't commend me to God. It doesn't, God doesn't say, oh, look, nice, righteous little boy. He eats almonds instead of peanuts. <laughs> and, and these things have nothing to do with my relationship with God unless... I believe that they do. And if I believe that they do, then they can hinder my relationship with God because I believe that they do. I had a fellow one day who said to me, Chuck, I would love to be a Christian. I would love to come to your church. I love church. I would love to serve the Lord. I'd like to be a part of your fellowship. But there's so much pressure at work. I'm under such constant strain that when I get home in the evening, I'm just sort of wrung out emotionally. And he said, I just have to sit down and drink a beer. And, and that's the way I relax. And I just need it. I, I can't do without it. I, I need that beer in order to just sort of wind down when I get home from work in the evening. I thought, well, I'll shock this guy. <laughs> and I said, who ever said you couldn't have a beer when you get home from work? I drink all the beer I want. His mouth dropped open. <laughs> he didn't know how to respond. But you see, that was an excuse that he was using, and I suddenly wiped out his excuse. He didn't become a part of the fellowship. The reasons were deeper than just the fact that he liked the beer when he got home at night. But in reality, there are those Christians who do believe that they can drink beer. And there are those who, if they drank a beer, would have a problem with their conscience. 
Now, the issues are the same. The one doesn't commend me to God. It doesn't make me any more righteous or less righteous. God accounts me righteous because of my faith in Jesus Christ, not because of what I eat or don't eat, drink or don't drink. It is my faith and trust in Jesus Christ that God accounts for righteousness. And so Paul said, meat doesn't commend me to God because if we eat, we're not any better, nor if we eat not, are we any the worse. But this is the issue. Take heed. Oh, let me clarify the former issue. I don't want to drink. <laughs> I drink all I want, but I don't want to drink. <laughs> I don't want you going around saying, hey, the pastor drinks all he wants, you know. <laughs> Chuck drinks like a fish. No, no. <laughs> In a sense, I long ago took a Nazarite vow from the time I was a child. My mother had dedicated me to the Lord. And I say to the glory of God and to his credit that I have never in my entire life had a swallow of an alcoholic beverage. And uh, that doesn't make me any closer to God or you know it doesn't commend me to God but it, that's just the way it is and having not started I don't expect to start any time <laughs> in the near future but take heed Paul says and this is the issue lest by any means this liberty of yours this freedom that you feel of eating the meat that's been sacrificed to idols. Lest the liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those that are weak. Those who are and would be troubled if they ate meat that they knew was sacrificed to an idol. Whose conscience would be offended who would feel alienated from God. And as I was saying earlier, if you feel that this will alienate you from God, it will. You see, it, it will hinder your faith in trusting and believing God. And, and a lot of people are, are feeling alienated from God over things that they need not to be alienated from God over, but because they've been taught this way. They believe it. They believe because they smoke cigarettes that, you know, they're lost and they're damned. And thus, they, they feel that, you know, I can't be a Christian because I can't kick the cigarettes. That's not so. You can smoke cigarettes and be a Christian. You can smoke a pipe and be a Christian. You can smoke cigars and be a Christian. A smelly one, but Christian nonetheless. <laughs> but if someone knows that you are a church member and maybe you're an usher or you have a position of prominence within the church and they see you driving down the street with a big old stogie <laughs> it could offend them spiritually it could stumble them 
And so Paul is saying it isn't the knowledge, knowing that, hey, no, this don't, won't alienate me from God. I, I mean, I have the liberty. But be careful that your liberty doesn't become a stumbling block to those that are weak. For if any man sees you, you that have this knowledge, if he sees you sitting at meat in the idol's temple, he walks by and he looks in and there you are sitting in the idol's temple and you're eating the meat that obviously has been sacrificed to that idol. Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which has been offered to idols? He sees you do it. He has respected you, looked up to you as a spiritual leader, as one who really walks with God, and, and he sees you. His conscience will be emboldened. Well, if he does it, I can do it. And so often people are watching us that we're not even aware that they are watching us. And especially when you get into a position of prominence, you're being scrutinized. And if you do something in the exercise of liberty, you say, well, I don't have any conscience again. That's, you know, what's an idol? It's nothing. It's not a god. But they are emboldened to do that. And yet, if they don't have that same understanding that you have, their conscience then can trouble them. They can feel guilty. They can feel condemned. They can feel alienated from God. And Satan can use that against them to actually drive a wedge between them and God because of their feeling of guilt and condemnation. And thus, through your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Should you exercise your liberty in such a way as to stumble a brother for whom Christ died? He said, when you sin against the brethren, you wound their weak conscience, and thus you are actually sinning against Christ. Now, you remember Jesus said that if a man would offend one of the little ones who believe in me, it would be better for that man if they would tie a millstone around his head and toss him in the sea than to offend one of the little ones. Paul talks about Christian liberty here in 1 Corinthians. He makes a very broad statement. We'll come across it again in a chapter or so. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I shouldn't exercise that freedom if it would cause a weak brother to stumble. Why should I destroy the person for whom Christ died just because I have liberty to do certain things? If I offend one of those little ones who believe in him, it's a serious offense against the Lord. Wherefore, conclusion, if meat makes my brother to be offended, I will eat no flesh while the world stands, lest I offend my brother. Love edifies. Love builds up. Walking in love, I'm not concerned for my own liberties. I'm concerned for my weaker brother who may be offended because 
I do feel certain liberties. And thus, walking in love, I seek to build up those in the body of Christ. It's a good rule to follow. Be careful that we don't do things that bring offense to the name of Jesus Christ. That people are offended by the things that I do. I'm, I do make this a rule in my life. I, I'm very careful and very conscious about being in the ministry and the fact that people are scrutinizing us. That's why I always buy used cars. I don't buy a new car, lest someone be offended. Oh, the preacher gets a new car, uh-huh. Wish I could afford a new car. <laughs> so I buy used cars. I don't, it doesn't bother me. They get me where I'm going. And we just need to watch these things because people are watching you. And some of them don't have the same depth of knowledge that you possess. They have weak consciousness or consciences. And they could be stumbled because of your liberties. Paul said, hast thou liberty? Have it to yourself. Keep it to yourself. <laughs> so, God help us. Not to just be thinking of ourselves, but be thinking of others. How will this look to others? How will others view this? Will this stumble them? Will this cause them to be offended? Then... I'll not eat meat as long as the world stands if it will bring an offense to a weak brother. I want to walk in love. I want to build them up, not destroy them. Father, help us. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful liberty that we have in Christ that he has set us free from the bondage of sin, from the power of sin. And Lord, he has given us such great freedom and such great liberty. And Lord, help us to be careful in the exercise of our liberties. that we not do it in such a manner as it brings offense to a weak brother. But let us walk in love. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? Love, 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 love. Christian, this is your call love your neighbor as yourself for god loves all love 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 christian this is